When we think about illicit drugs and the associated problems, what often comes to mind? I imagine most of us will think of the cartels of Mexico or perhaps the Andrangita in Calabria. One thing is likely, however, and it is that the African continent is not your first thought. For a long time, the relationship between Africa and illicit drugs was little explored in comparison to other parts of the world. It is often seen as little more than a transit region for drugs going to other places, usually Europe. Over the years, however, our understanding of illicit drugs and their use on the African continent has grown. These include the traditional dows carrying heroin down the eastern coast, or the precursor chemicals for methamphetamine being exchanged for illegally poached abalone sea snail. Nowadays, there's domestic production of synthetic drugs that are exported internationally. Our limited understanding also extended to domestic consumption. Were these drugs just concentrated in the coastal regions? Or do they penetrate the huge interior of the African continent? Well, that's where Jason Eli comes into the conversation. Jason is a senior expert and thematic lead of Drugs at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Over the past few years, he and his team have been trying to answer these questions in East and Southern Africa, coming up with an innovative research method to find out just how far illicit drugs go and to truly understand the size of the market. Welcome to The Index from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. I'm your host, Thin Lewin. Another interviewee we're speaking to in this episode is Karen Dolly, a South African journalist who has been covering organized crime for nearly two decades. Karen is author of the book Clash of Cartels, unmasking the global drug kingpins stalking South Africa. We also have Bernice Apondi, policy manager at Voices for Community Action and Leadership in Kenya, and a consultant in research and drug policy. But first, Jason Eli, the thematic lead on drugs at the GI, who began by explaining the role of East and Southern Africa in today's global drug trade. Let's look at it geographically. The region is very well placed in between some significant production points for illicit drugs. So cocaine is produced in Latin America and is shipped out of that region to points around the world. Heroin, the majority of heroin that's produced in the world, comes out of Afghanistan and and departs the region through Pakistan, Iran, and, and other neighboring countries. And the eastern and southern Africa region is placed uh, largely in between these two significant producer points. So it, it's a great facilitator for the eastward movement of cocaine and the westward movement of both heroin and increasingly uh, methamphetamine. It's a location that geographically is well positioned as a transit point. But if we look at the way that the region has developed over the last 30, 35 years, it's also an excellent location in terms of infrastructure. You have numerous ports that dot along the Swahili coast that are reasonably modern, that uh, many, many of which are deep water ports and can handle large container loads, containerization being one of the primary modes for movement of drugs like heroin and also uh, cocaine around the world. You're seeing these ports are, are well connected by roads to major cities and therefore to airports, which is another means through which these substances are moved to the region, through the region, and to, to other secondary regions. So, for example, into Johannesburg, the airport in Johannesburg, which is a major import location for cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine in particular. And then from there to a variety of other neighboring countries and, and city markets. So development has enabled the, the port facilities and the infrastructure 
to really be very accommodating to the movement of commodities, obviously designed to move licit goods through markets, but um, where licit goods can flow more freely, so can illicit goods. Mm, thank you very much, Jason, for the, for essentially giving us a geographical lesson as well. Now, for this episode, we're covering both the East and Southern Africa, right? But these, we know that these are two very distinct regions and they're, you know, a total of 22 countries. And I really don't want us to sort of make sweeping generalizations about what's happening. Um, so I would like to flesh out the specific cases of each region. And I want to start with South Africa, which has the most mature drugs market. Karen, can you tell us how South Africa got to this stage and how it looks today? South Africa currently has a thriving drug market. That's drugs that are being produced in the country as well as being brought into the country and moved through it. And if you analyze South Africa and illicit drugs, this goes this predates democracy. So this goes back to when South Africa was an apartheid state pre-1994. And what was happening was that the apartheid government was actually involved in producing drugs, including Mandrax. And they were also allegedly planning to peddle this Mandrax to residents to as a form of crowd control. So we've had the apartheid government making its own Mandrax, also bringing it in. And at the same time, around 1994, there were allegations and suspicions that Italy's mafia, Cosa Nostra, had set up in South Africa. So that takes us back more than 20 odd years. And if we look at what's happened since then, it looks like the same blueprint and the same routes that were used back then are still in use, just different players. Some of the same players, but some of them have been murdered. Some of them have moved on. For example, we look at India. We know that back in the 90s, um, Dawood Ibrahim Kaskar, who is still wanted, he was someone who was flagged as working or operating via South Africa and, of course, more broadly, Africa. He's criminal organization known as D Company does have a presence in South Africa. Very little is put to the public about that via the government, though. We've also got an individual, Vicky Goswami, who is possibly jailed in the US as I speak at the moment. He is originally from India. He was involved in South Africa's drug trade until very recently. And he operated with individuals, including the Akasha organization from Kenya. So these figures who were pivotal quite a few decades ago, have been and are still pivotal, to, I would argue, up until today. If you hear what Vicky Goswami has testified in the US in an open court, he said that his, for lack of a better word, his syndicate or his gang tried to dominate South Africa's drug market in terms of Mandrax. We've also seen masses of cocaine landing up in Durban in South Africa, the port of Durban, and a lot of that is coming from South America. We've had Fuminho, Gilberto, Aparecido dos Santos of PCC, or First Capital Command of Brazil. He has been in South Africa before being arrested in Mozambique, and there are suspicions that a lot of the cocaine that is being pumped through South Africa via Durban is from Drizzle's PCC. And then we've also had lots of drug interceptions in Australia that link back to South Africa. South Africa has also experienced what we would call Balkan organized crime. We see figures from Serbia who are assassinated in almost movie style over the top hits in which firearms are used on vehicles that are then set alight. And it's a deep belief that these figures are part and parcel of international, transnational drug dealing, but they also perhaps may have links to the South African state. So yeah, those are just a few countries to name a few. We know that drugs are coming in by way of Mozambique. We know that the drug channels between South Africa and China. Um, I feel I could go on and on and on and create an entire world map here. But as you can see, South Africa is extremely established in terms of the global drug trade. Mm, okay, no, that's, that's super helpful. Um, Jason, I'm actually going to turn to you next because... Karen has spoken in particular about South Africa. Um, can you tell us where South Africa sits in comparison to other countries in the region? Well, South Africa is the largest uh, illicit drug consumer market in the region. I don't think that's a surprise for uh, many people, given the size of the population. But it's also a cornerstone in the transit 
of uh, illicit drugs through the region. This is in large part due to its geographic location, but also to the level of development of its ports. It's a fixture in the transportation of commodities, both transatlantic and to and through the Indian Ocean, connecting North America and Europe with East Asia and South Asia. So it's very well placed in in that respect. There's also a significant amount of production occurring in South Africa. I would say not as much today as there was historically over the past 30, 40 years, but it it is a, a source or an origin point for drugs that are moving into the interior countries. So the, the countries that are not coastal, thinking here of, of Malawi, of Zimbabwe, of Zambia. These are countries that are getting a significant portion of the drugs that are being consumed there, either via South Africa uh, from other countries or directly produced in and, and shipped to those countries from South Africa. If we look at the major drugs, we've seen, if we're looking at the region more broadly, you're looking at heroin that has been moving from north to south along the eastern and southern coast, you know, coming down from Kenya through Tanzania into Mozambique. You're seeing cocaine that is moving from South Africa and and further north. Durban port in South Africa is a significant port for the importation and exportation of of cocaine in the region, but also so is uh, the port in Dar es Salaam, and so is the coastal region of of Kenya from Mombasa and moving north to places like Kalifi. So the region as a whole, I think if, if we think of South Africa as a drug market anchor, there's a significant influence Uh, from South Africa in terms of what is happening there in in the consumer drug market and what then is moving into neighboring countries because the region is every day getting better and better connected by roads, by air. And as these goods are flowing and people are flowing, so do uh, illicit drugs. Great. Thanks for that, Jason. It's interesting, right, how the mobility, like you said, the the better the connectivity and mobility become for goods and and people. Unfortunately, that also meant it's so much easier for illicit drugs to to move. One of the things Jason mentioned earlier just now was Kenya and East Africa, and I want to turn our attention to that region. And Bernice, the next few questions I have are for you. But first, could you tell us what's the situation in countries like Kenya, where you're based? So Kenya generally right now, we are seeing a growing increase in people who use drugs and also people who sell. We have seen a lot of young people turning up for drug treatment, but there's a lot more that do not turn up. We have seen government opening more centers for treatment for people who use drugs. That tells you there are more and more young people getting in to use. But then as we studied the market, we also noticed that a lot of people who use also sell. And the number of people who sell has grown. The number of towns where drugs can be found have also increased. Initially, we used to talk about the coastal part of Kenya. And initially, we used to blame tourism. But then we realized that it's no longer the coasts part alone. Even in the interior, along the border parts like Trukana, bordering Kenya with Sudan and Ethiopia. There's a lot of drug trade going on. Uh, Busia, the border of Kenya and Uganda. Then the Sirare, Busia, uh, Sirare, the border of Kenya and Tanzania. And even the inland, there are very many small towns where during our research, there's a seller, of course, that is known, and then there are users. And there's also a a characteristic that every town where there is a a higher learning of institution, where there are university students, there is a seller that is stationed there. So that just shows you the the increase in the number of people that are selling and the drugs that are in the market. We have also seen so many types of drugs coming up in Kenya. 
in 2019, the Kenya Airways first tweeted that they they, they arrested methamphetamine uh, that was imported in headphones. That's when people were first officially hearing of meth. But in Mombasa, we already had foreigners selling meth to university students. We have seen uh, photos of uh, drug users at the coast uh, walking without clothes, and specialists tell us that should be acid or LSD. And we know there's heroin and then there's cocaine and there's the diverted pharmaceuticals. And we've seen a lot of young people just mixing and forming cocktails with, with whatever they have in their hands so that they, they are able to, to create new experiences. So according to our research, we know there's an increase, of course, in sale, importation and use. What you said, Bernice, just now about how, you know, the illicit drugs have managed to steep into even remote areas. And I want to later on ask Jason about that, but I I want to stay a bit more in in East Africa in more general. So from what you've just said, it sounds like the market is essentially growing and and at quite a fast rate. Is that is that an accurate way to describe it? Yeah, it is accurate because there's a very hungry population of young people who are jobless. Everybody's looking for money. And so there's also an influx of Nigerians in Nairobi that I think have been doing the trade for a while. Knowing that the market is there, knowing that the money is there, and you have a host of young people who are creative with internet and social media, and they know they use money mobile. You don't have to take this money to the bank. Yes, the environment is ripe for young people to do this trade, and we've seen them. We are seeing the new money in Nairobi right now. It's all over. It's in politics. It's in trade. It's in the music industry. So, yes, it it is growing. That's really interesting, Bernice. And Jason, um, with regards to the fact that these illicit drugs have managed to seep you know, into this remote inland rural areas that Bernice was uh, talking about earlier. Is this something that you've witnessed throughout your research in, in, in both these regions? And, and did that surprise you? I think the first thing we need to recognize when we look at the issue of, of drugs in this region, and, and for that matter, other regions around the world, is that we tend to think we know more about what's going on than we really do. And I think some of the points that that Bernice raised are are really important. From the observations that we've made in the research uh, that we've been doing, and I know in in research that Bernice has been involved in, we really come to realize that the way that drugs are presented in many countries of the region, the way they're talked about by government officials, authorities, does not really reflect the reality of what the situation is on the ground uh, in these countries. For example, if we look at the issue of of transit, there are innumerable occasions where senior police officials, when they're fortunate enough to make a seizure, will speak about the fact that either the drugs that were seized were completely in transit, we're moving from one location to another, or only a tiny portion of the drugs would have remained in the market for consumption and the remainder would be moving on. There's this view that drug use as a whole, particularly so-called hard drugs, cocaine, methamphetamine, are rarely used uh, in the region. And in, in many instances, government officials would attest that They're, in fact, not used in their own countries. And the research that uh, we've been undertaking demonstrates that this is truly false, that, in fact, there is a significant domestic consumer market for all of these substances that exists across the region. And this is not just in, in the coastal areas where a lot of illicit drugs move, as, as Bernice said. But there has been rapid growth of drug use in areas that are far away from the coast, far away from from large cities. And a lot of this has gotten down to some very basic characteristics of these regions. Poverty being one, underdevelopment, lack of opportunity, an expanding population of young people who want to be able to do something with their life who lack the opportunities to move ahead. And if we couple that with 
a way of looking at illicit drugs not as this illegal thing out there, this other thing that is that is bad, but instead, if we look at them as an economic commodity, which is what they are, then you begin to see why their proliferation in markets around the region is is becoming so widespread. It is a way to make money and to make a lot of money quite quickly. And there is a very strong demand. So were we surprised in some of the things we found? Naturally, I, I, I think you can't help but be surprised when you go to some areas and expect to see more traditional drug use behavior, the injection of heroin, maybe the use of, of some crack cocaine. But then you realize that the area is rife with uh, synthetic drugs like crystal methamphetamine uh, and a variety of other substances, synthetic cannabinoids, that nobody is, is even talking about in, in the national picture, let alone the, the regional picture. And, and you start to see that the markets themselves and what is occurring in these markets are years ahead of what government officials and others are, are saying is occurring in these regions. That's a very sobering um, analysis, Jason. I also have another question for you. I mean, one of the things that struck me with your research was that you actually gathered data from drug users as well. Can you tell us why that was important for you to do that? Well, I would say we didn't just speak with people who use drugs. They were centrally involved in all aspects of the research, a variety of pieces of research that we've been undertaking in the region for the last four years. I would say, who knows a drug market better than a person who uses drugs, who, who exists in that market and participates in it every single day? Who can tell you the subtle changes in the market better than a person who uses drugs? Who can tell you how new substances have come in and why and how a market is moving and who are the larger actors than a person who uses drugs? So getting them involved as partners in the research, participating in the design of the research, participating in, in the implementation of the research, being active participants in, in the analysis and verification of the work that we've been doing is is i think just common sense i think we've been missing for many many years a significant voice and a significant area of expertise in examining these markets through the exclusion of people who who use drugs and the exclusion of civil society organizations that work closely with these populations so i think not just from the perspective of getting a more accurate and more current picture of what's going on, but also from the perspective of what is just right. People who use drugs are not subjects of research, and even though they've been treated as, as, as the objects that, that are looked at and then researchers go away and present their findings or publish their findings and nothing ever happens back in the community again, they, they, they should be, and, and I would even say must be, partners in the research that goes on so that the information that is gathered is allowed to not just remain in the community, but to inform. That's really, I think, quite critical and important perspective as, as well. And, and I think you're absolutely right in that countries, uh, policymakers, law enforcement officials come up with these policies around drugs and, you know, drug use and all of that. And a lot of the times, yeah, they, they, they ignore the people who are right in the middle of it and come up with ways of, of I guess, supporting them. And, and that's, that's actually my next question, because, you know, we've talked about not just the fact that you have, you know, these illicit drugs that are going through these two regions, but that there is a significant part of the populations in both East and Southern Africa that actually are users. So I'd like 
to spend a few minutes just talking about some of the public health burden that's arising from the drugs market. And Karen, can I come to you first? Because I think this is a real issue in South Africa, isn't it? Can you tell us a little bit more? Absolutely. And I think what Jason mentioned earlier about illicit drugs being a way to make money is so critical in responding to this because in South Africa, we we have a huge unemployment problem. We have a huge problem of people living in dire, poor conditions. And on top of that, we've got what we call or what the government calls load shedding. These are rolling power cuts. And the reason I bring that into this is because aside from an active drug using and drug abusing population, there are peripheral issues at play. And it's not, and what I'm trying to say, perhaps illustrate is that it's not just sort of gangsters using drugs so that it's easier to commit the next crime mentally. It's softer on them to be able to do what's next. But we have a population that is in distress. And I think drug use is across the board in terms of income. And I think where there's a real problem is where we've got drug users who are not necessarily able to get treatment because of their lack of income and because of their proximity and access to resources. So, yes, it's a problem in South Africa, and this has a ripple effect on our prison population as well, because in criminalizing drug users, it boosts the prison population, and we already have overpopulated prisons with very poor conditions, and this will obviously have an impact on health. We also have lots of drugs in prisons. You can see that by confiscations made. And again, it shows that what is happening on the outside is happening in prison, and that's another sort of simmering crisis, or I can almost say it's a simmering by crisis, part of the bigger crisis. Yeah, something we don't necessarily think of when we look at drug abuse and drug use and especially drug manufacturing is the impact on the environment and the impact on non-drug users. And there is an impact. So for example, if you look at drug manufacturing question, what impact that has on the actual literal environment on soil quality, because then we have to look at, okay, what quality food are we growing and what What quality food are people ingesting? Also, um, the oceans, what is actually being pumped into the sea? Yeah, it's so much more than, I mean, South Africa is a coastal country, and it's so much more than what's just happening on the streets in front of us. There is, I would say, a hidden, almost, yeah, a masked crisis about how drug users are able to access treatment. And we also have to look at intent, whether people want to be accessing treatment. The Eastern and Southern Africa Commission on Drugs was launched recently, about a month or so ago. And I think in terms of this question, it's a brilliant initiative slash idea because they are hoping to remove focus from drug users or remove the criminal, or let me put it this way, they're hoping to remove the lens of criminality when viewing drug users and instead focus on harm reduction. And I think that's really important because I think in exactly what Jason was saying earlier, in demystifying the sort of illicit drugs, etc., and seeing it for what it is, is the way this problem can be approached and treated. Yeah, thank you, Karen. And I think what both you and Jason have answered again in, in some ways illustrate or highlight the importance that if we want to tackle this whole, you know, illicit organized drug networks, criminal networks, we can't just see them in silo and as completely disconnected from the social, socioeconomic, right, environment and the locals and the use and, and, and the root causes as to why these markets and and syndicates flourish in these regions in the first place. So that's, I think, is a really important way to look at it. And Bernice, I want to hear from you about East Africa and whether there are, you know, support for drug users in countries like Kenya, Tanzania or other places. And if there is support, what kind of support is in place? Uh, I'll start by giving a point about um, drug use being found in rural areas. In Kenya, 
What we found out that was again very unique was that the drug users were telling us that when some of them have been using for a very long time, so they got into the records of the police. So um, for the policemen who are sympathetic, they will arrest you, release you, arrest you. Some of them have been from, from prison. They come back and they start using again. So when you get arrested the second or the third time, the policeman tells you, I don't want to see you here again. Can you go back to the village? Now, Kenya, we live in the town areas and then there are rural areas. So when a policeman gives you a warning, automatically you fear for your life. And then they tell you, can you go away to the village? I don't want to see you here again. So most of them retreat back to the rural areas. When they retreat back to the rural areas and they, they, they realize, okay, now here there's no seller. I can start doing this. And then they began selling. So that one also contributed to the criminalization and, you know, trying to escape the, the criminal justice system. We found several of them that had come away from, you know, moved away from Mombasa actually to go and set base in as far as Kisi, you know, next to the border of Kenya and Tanzania. And then they tell you, as I came here, I realized there was no seller. So he decided to set base. And then, you know, they started their own small businesses and that is how they continue living. So when it comes to the support given to people who use drugs, well, it's minimal. It's really, really minimal, even when it comes to what we call healthcare for all. And we say leaving no one behind. We still just see harm reduction services for people who use drugs. And because this country, we talk about scarcity of resources, it is not implemented 100%. So we see mostly the biomedical aspect, the, the opiate substitution therapy, which is also going through a lot of challenges because of dropouts. Psychosocial support is not yet up to standard. Because again, just structural discrimination, there's no treatment for mental health. And then the mental health from the drug use go hand in hand. If you find seeing a psychiatric is expensive, then they say, okay, let me just go and smoke my heroin and deal with my, my, my mental illness my own way. That is something that we have seen a lot in the healthcare system. We have seen women also being turned away. Healthcare facilities not knowing how to deal with the opioid babies and the level of disappointment. And, and so even though the healthcare is there, yes, it is pegged to HIV. So what happens if you're not HIV positive? Because then that's also another level of discrimination. If you are not having HIV, then that means you cannot access the card. Then that means you cannot access treatment. So the healthcare is there. But even in the system, we are still seeing a lot of discrimination. Besides that, in the universities, there's none. We are still seeing um, drug users being expelled. You use your scholarship, your government scholarship, when you're found to be using. We are still seeing a lot of expensive treatment for hepatitis C, for example, does not exist in Kenya, except in the private sector. And it is very expensive. We are talking about 700 US dollars per treatment. An ordinary person cannot afford. It is not there in public health facilities. You have to go to the Aga Khan Hospital, for example. Very few, maybe only 1% of Kenyans can afford that. So even though we are seeing government coming up with support systems, it's only healthcare. It is 30%. And the rest of behavior change, psychosocial support, which is very important when it comes to management of drug use, is still left behind. And then even in the opioid substitution therapy program, it's still a lot of donor money. So we're actually in the space of talking to government right now through a bill that we want to introduce in parliament so that we can have domestic funding for these donor-funded projects. Again, it's very sobering to hear you speak. You know, it's just multiple levels of challenges as well as discrimination and, you know, right, uncoupling all of that, the sustainability, the long-term viability of the, of the support as well. It's quite a challenge. And I guess for the next few minutes, I want to focus on talking about resilience and, and, and perhaps support so that, you know, these communities, these countries, these regions are able to sort of resist some of the issues and the fallouts, I guess, you know, around these organized drug routes and networks and, and everything that is associated with this. Jason, can I ask you to start first and perhaps tell us a bit about any efforts to improve resilience of, you know, public institutions, of civil society, of journalists, or, you know, researchers and experts like yourself in these two regions, and whether they've been effective or not? So the first, I would say, is, is the resilience of the community to try and withstand 
the harms and the environmental degradation that is related to the rapid growth of, of drug markets in these areas. And I think Bernice touched on quite a few uh, really relevant points in this regard. I think the the major, one of the major uh, impacts is, of course, in the field of health. And we look at the fact that the region still today is home to a significant proportion of the world's people, population of people who live uh, with HIV. We look at the privatization of drug treatment services, again, is a serious concern because it's, it's, it's making these services priced out of the access to, to people who really, really need them. And it's taking the responsibility of the service away from the government and putting it in the hands of uh, private individuals. I think a lot of the limited success that's occurred in the region in terms of building community resilience is down to the civil society organizations, organizations like uh, the one that Bernice is involved in and many others who dedicate their existence to trying to support communities in responding to a lot of these harms and are doing it in an environment that is increasingly hostile from, from governments in the region and also doing it in an environment that is increasingly devoid of, of financial investment, not just from governments, but also from international donors that have been in recent years significantly rolling back their investment in, in programs like this. My organization, the Global Initiative, has a, a program where we're trying to step in to provide some assistance, but it's a small amount in the grander scheme of, of what is needed. The second part of resilience, I think also, is maybe the, the, the more dramatic, and that's the resilience of drug markets themselves. So if we look at over the last 20 odd years, we've seen some levels of seizures of a variety of substances that are, are moving through the region, and we've discussed some of this we see repeatedly government campaigns that go around and arrest people who use drugs. We've seen some dealers arrested and, and some major networks uncovered and interdicted against. And yet, in spite of these actions and in spite of significant financial investment by governments into their police services, these markets have continued to grow there's really been no impact at all. And if anything, the impact has been one of, of making the markets more resilient. The level of corruption and complicity of government officials and institutions that continue to enable the, the markets themselves to exist and the actors involved in these markets to continue operating in, in the way that they've always been operating. Thanks, Jason. That is a, a very comprehensive list, I think, of, of the shortcomings and almost a blueprint of what can be done to improve things. And, you know, here I'm wanting to play a bit of a the devil's advocate, right, because the war on drugs has been going on for a very long time. And I think particularly from where I guess I'm sitting, you know, in, 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 in Europe, but also in US and most Western countries that has been the war on drugs has been going on for a long time and the penalties are pretty punitive. It's all about criminalization. But it also feels like, you know, the criminals, the drug networks are always always one step ahead. And I think, you know, you yourself talked very eloquently just now about the lack of impact in the two regions that we're focusing on today. So where are we going wrong? With all of this effort, would you say there's a more effective alternative way to deal with the illicit drug trade? In terms of going forward, I think there are a few things that we need to consider. First and foremost, we need to accept that the prohibition-based approach, the, the targeted approach against people who use drugs, has not worked and won't work, no matter how much money is, is thrown into it. Secondly, we then, therefore need to consider alternatives, alternative approaches, alternative policy approaches. 
And there are a number out there from decriminalization through to legalization regulation through to massive in increases in investment in, in health infrastructure and a variety of other of other ways, some of which uh, have been tried in the region on, on a limited basis and many others that haven't been but but should be discussed going forward. The third thing I would say is that we need to recognize also from an official point of view, we really don't know what's going on in our drug markets. Governments of the region really have little to no idea what is happening uh, in terms of uh, drugs and drug markets in their countries. So I think there needs to be a much better approach taken to aspects of, of surveillance to, to try and improve the data about what is going on in the region. Simple things are not known. Most of the countries of the region have no idea roughly how many people use drugs in their country. Most of them have no idea of the diversity of substances that are being used in their country. And most of them have, have no idea on how and where these substances uh, are, are being used. So how can you develop an informed national drug policy and strategy to respond to the harms of drugs if you have no idea of the basics of, of the market that you wish to, to try and respond to? So I think uh, uh, in, in terms of going forward, we need to look at, at these three things in particular uh, and then move, uh, move on from there. Great. Thank you so much, Jason. That's uh, really, really comprehensive. I wanted to ask, you know, Karen and Bernice, if there's anything else um, you'd like to add, anything else you want to say? I, th I think for Kenya, it's time that we looked at drug use from a, a public health lens. In as much as trafficking and selling should remain criminalized, use and dependence should be treated as a public health issue. And we should open up our primary health care facilities to be able to treat drug use disorders. Because when, when, when we continue to limit the treatment based on what you're using, are you injecting, are you not injecting, we are still limiting the number of people that are coming out. When we criminalize use, we are still limiting the number of people that are coming out. And psychologically, when you, when you criminalize the use of these substances, it, it becomes a psychological goal. You know, it's, there is more hiding in the behavior. And the ones who are curious enough will still continue using and using and using. And that's why even opioid overdose is now becoming a thing in Kenya right now. Because families don't want to talk about drug use. Uh, the government does not want to talk about drug use. Anytime I go to a meeting and I start talking about drug use, everybody thinks I'm selling because they, they don't understand why you should be talking about it in the open. It is because we are treating use the same way we are treating capital offenses. And if we do not take a community perspective that these people are part of us, they're our brothers, they're our sisters, we may fall into drug use because we are not able to deal with the pressures of life. But when we are supported through it, then we can able to get out of it and also help other people to get out of it. So we need to start using, looking at drug users with a public health lens. That way, we can have a multi-sectoral approach to do this. Thank you, Bernice. Karen, any final thoughts? Absolutely. From my perspective, based in South Africa, I fully agree with both Jason and Bernice. And I would say that instead of a war on drug users and drugs, rather shift that focus into a targeted eradication of state corruption and going after criminal kingpins, and we could see a shift in the illicit drug trade. This is where we leave it for this episode of The Index from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. A big thank you to Jason, Karen, and Bernice for joining us today. You'll find links to any related reading for this episode in the podcast notes. And this include Jason's three papers that cover cocaine, methamphetamine, and heroin in East and Southern Africa. This podcast series is based on the Global Organized Crime Index, which lists 
193 countries around the world and scores their levels of criminality and resilience. Remember that this is a free resource and can be accessed by anyone. Just head over to ocindex.net. We'll also put a link to all the individual country profiles mentioned in this episode. We'll be back in a few weeks with a new episode of The Index. I'm Tin Lai Nguyen. Thanks for listening. Thank you.